So what kind of things are we limited by? We mentioned one already. Like our natural intelligence, our IQ that we're born with. What are some other things that limit us? Our environment. Right, explain. Um, like, a like home situation, I guess. Like, like, or like school, like, like just anything, you know, like so many things. Like your environment, your your friends. Like just. Your environment. So we'll take one of those. How do, how does a home environment limit us, maybe? Uh, like. Like money wise, like your parents might like not have money or they might have too much money, you know? And then like if they have too much money, I guess there's not as many like limitations, you know? Because you can do more with more money, like, you know? What kind of limitations does having too much money present? <laughs> I know we like to think that there are none, but there are lots. Too much money? Yeah. <coughs> Overspending? That's not really a limitation. Well, okay, why not? So how would how would overspending become a limitation? It's not really. Because when you're overspending, you don't really have a limit. Spending more than you have. Okay, so maybe spend, and, and how could that be a limitation on a person? Um, Can I help him out? How could that be? You won't have money for like other things that you need, like food and or like rent or like yeah. bills. It's a tremendous, you know? yeah, it's a tremendous amount of money. Also, think about think about where your thoughts go. If you spend too much money and you run out of money, where do your thoughts go? Down. Yeah. They go to those other things. If you're thinking about having to, if you're thinking about, if you're worried about money, what are you probably not worried about? Things like the theory of relativity. You're probably not too worried about metaphors and poetry. You're probably not too worried about writing the next great novel. Although that worked out pretty well for J.K. Rowling. That is what motivated her. Um, she was essentially on, on, on public assistance, the British version of public assistance couldn't find a job. So because she couldn't find a job, she didn't just sit around all day and watch daytime TV. She went down to a, to a coffee shop and she wrote Harry Potter series. That worked out pretty well for her. Worked out pretty well for her. But there are lots of limitations that, that having too much money create for us. We just don't see it. Because we like to think that, you know, whatever situation somebody else is in, it must be better than my situation. Because my situation has to be trash. Um, that might, they might have it better, and it might be true that they have it better, and it might be true that they have problems, but that the problems that they have aren't as difficult as the problems that we go through. But that's not a bad thing. If you don't go through, um, I don't know if it was in this class, but I don't think it was. <clears throat> um, you know how gravity works? Who can explain to me how gravity works? When you attract the marker? Yeah, so that would be an example of, of gravity. Essentially, the more mass that a thing has, think of space as being a fabric, like an actual like fabric. And that's what space, that's what time space is. This is what Einstein shows. We think of it as just like empty space. Excuse me, it's called space, but that's not what it is. It's actually we're living within a fabric. Um, it just kind of, I can explain it to you a little deeper, but trust me on it for now. And the way that it works is you have an object, and it sits in that fabric. And you see that divot it makes? That, the, the, the divot it makes is dependent on its mass. So a, a, an object with, with less mass does this, an object with more mass does this, an object with a lot of mass does this. So when we say things like, oh, gravity pulls things in, not really. The, in the, it pulls it in in the same way that we would say that a drain pulls water in. In other words, things will start to pass by it, and then it gets caught up in, the, in that, we call the event, the, uh, right here, this event horizon thing. Event horizon is normally for black holes, but you, you, you'll get the idea. And so once it catches there, it gets caught in there and it starts to spin. And you've seen those like marbles that will spin in a circle for a long time. Eventually what happens is the marble either gets pulled into it or it gets ejected out of that. One of those two things. But the more mass something has, the deeper kind of its, its gravity well is. Does this, this make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think of space as that, top, uh, as fabric. It, it actually just kind of doesn't, doesn't pull things in, but things get caught up in, in that gravity. So now, 
when you see, when you go down to the, the, the signs of the Space Museum, and they say things like, if you are, if you weigh 150 pounds on Earth, you would weigh, whatever, 450 pounds, or whatever it is, on Jupiter. And you guys like, wow, why would that be? Because that gravity well is deeper, so, you're fall, you, so it's pulling you harder kind of into it, you're falling harder into it. Which means that if you stood on the surface of Jupiter, there is no surface of Jupiter. It's mm -hmm. all gas. But let's just say there was a surface for Ju of Jupiter. If you stood on the surface of Jupiter, and you weigh 150 pounds, it would be like you'd have a 300 pound backpack on you. And you'd have to start walking around Jupiter with this 300 pound backpack on you, so you weigh 450 pounds. So far so good? Okay. Let's say that you could survive that. How strong would you be? How, how strong would you be after a couple years? Pretty strong. Pretty damn strong. Pretty damn strong. Now, if, I, if you were 150 pounds, and I said, okay, tell you what, let's put you on an even bigger plant, so now you're carrying 1,000 pounds, mm -hmm. and threw a 1,000 pound backpack on you. Well, what would happen to you? You'd get crushed. Yeah. Boom. Now you'd be down there going, come on, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> you couldn't do it. In other words, there's too much on top of you. Oftentimes in life, we confuse having that 1,000-pound backpack with having that 300-pound backpack. The 300-pound backpack is heavy. Yes, it's cumbersome. Yes, but man, if you can walk around for a couple of years, you'll be, you'll be made much, much stronger by that thing. If I throw the 1,000 pounds on you, you're crushed. No way around it. So now... I take you off the surface of Jupiter, and I put you back on Earth. Now you're not just carrying on the weight of 150 pounds, I'm sorry, you're still just carrying the weight of 150 pounds, but you're used to that 450 pounds. How much more can you actually do now? You know, you're going to be incredibly strong compared to the average human. You'll be faster, stronger, you'll be more resilient. If I, if, now let's say instead of being on the Earth, you're on the Moon, and the, Earth, and the Moon has the, what, a third? The mass of, of Earth, maybe less than that. So, or better yet, how about this? You grew up in space where there's no gravity, or very little gravity. And then I take you and I put you on Earth. That's worse than having a thousand pound backpack because you've never had any resistance in your life. So now when I give you even just a little bit of resistance, you fall apart under it. Does this make sense? This can be part of the problem of growing up with too much money. You don't want to grow up with so little that you've got a thousand pound backpack on you so that you feel like you have to kind of do whatever you have to do to survive. Get this backpack off of me. I don't know, man. It seems like it's a lot. Uh, what are you willing to do for it? Anything. Name it. Want me to kill? I'll kill for it. Fine. Whatever. And then someone can help you get that. And then someone can come along and say, well, we've got these, this gang of people who can help you carry this backpack. Sure. You know, sometimes you feel like you have no alternative and you just might. We, we, we talked about that a few weeks ago. Um, but don't, be, don't, don't confuse having that 300 pound backpack with needing that same kind of support. Would it be helpful to have that support? In the short run. And while you're carrying on that big backpack, you probably don't want to have me sitting there going, come on man, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, you've got this. You know, and you, you may even be pissed about it, dude, you can help me carry this backpack, but you refuse. You know, and you can end up hating my guts for it. But the fact of the matter is that once you get back into a normal environment, then you're going to be way stronger once you're there. And so, we want to be careful about assuming that, that, that rich people or people with lots and lots of privilege don't have any kind of struggles. Uh, they have lots of struggles because every little thing is a struggle. Everything that they encounter that's any kind of a small disturbance is going to be a struggle. You know? Damn it. I said you know. You know? And so... We have to be careful of exactly what just happened. You can't discuss the ocean with a well frog. It's difficult to discuss the problems of the wealthy with the poor. And it's difficult to discuss the problems of the poor with the wealthy. And it's difficult to discuss both of those problems with the people who are in the middle. It's difficult for us to, to think outside of where we are. <clears throat> because of where we are, we struggle. And there's this presumption that nobody else struggles quite the same way. And even if we come across people who struggle way more than us. We had a tendency to go, wow, that sucks, at least I'm not like that. But then we go back to our own lives and we complain about the struggles that we go through. 
Complaining about struggles is one thing, but just understand that complaining to solve your problems is as a it's as effective as chewing bubble gum while trying to solve an algebra equation. It's got nothing to do with the solution. And that isn't a way of saying that, God, quit complaining. No, it's a way of saying just understand that when you do, you're inhibiting yourself. You don't really bother anybody else around you except that you annoy them with the complaining. That's probably true. But more than anything, you're harming yourself because the more that you kind of pile those complaints onto ourselves, we almost convince ourselves that there's nothing outside of the well. You know? We can convince ourselves there's nothing outside the well. Now let's say that you have a frog, and he does escape the well. And he goes out. What does he encounter out in the world? What's out in the world that's not inside of a well? It's a hard question to answer, I know. Yeah, because our answer tends to be everything. Because it almost seems like it. What's, I mean, it, 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 would, it would be faster for us to limit the things that are not out in the world, you know? We've got um, water, <laughs> darkness, uh, probably some moss, maybe a little bit of milk. No, probably no mildew because it's open. But there's not much in there. And once you get outside of that, now imagine you're a frog, and you, uh, a well frog, and you've got a family of well frogs that are down there. And somehow, some way, maybe it's because you're the one well frog who looks up and sees the sky and goes, I wonder what's out there. First off, you have to be able to conceptualize that there's even such a thing as out there. It seems like a normal thing. And of course you would wonder, no, <laughs> no, no. There's a reason that as humans, we sat in sub-Saharan Africa for a hundred and something thousand years before one dude finally goes like, I wonder what's over there, past the desert. And he was probably told by people, nothing. Once you go past, I mean, when you go out that way, anybody who goes that way never comes back. <clears throat> probably just nothing but death. And then y'all, what that guy hears is the word probably. So we don't know. No. All right, so he knows it's hot that way, because he knows it's desert, so he grabs as much water as he can, he's like, all right, be well. <laughs> and then he heads north. And then he, maybe one of the reasons they never came back was because they found cooler environments as they exited Africa. But that's one of those things I really want to do. Man. I want to go to the, the Serengeti in Africa. And I want to be able to stand out there, just hundreds of miles from even the nearest city, and look up at the sky and see the stars that our, that our ancestors saw. Now, one of them looked at it and said, I'm going to follow that and see what goes that way. So it's not a normal thing for humans necessarily to say, I wonder what's out there. And it's even more rare for someone to say, let me go find out. So... Let's say that you are that one well frog who escapes the well. You do go out and look. And you encounter this world that is just unbelievably rich compared to the world that you just left. There's nothing wrong with the world that you left. But once you've exited that world, now you see that there's so much more to life than you even realized. There's more to life than you could even conceptualize. Literally, you cannot conceptualize that things are outside that well when you're living in it. Similarly, it's almost impossible for us to conceptualize what's awaiting us in life if we limit ourselves to our current perspectives and geographies, beliefs of our families, and our cultures, and our friends, and all the things around us. It's comfortable to be where we are. Understand that even if it doesn't make us happy, I imagine there's still something in most of you that pulls you and tells you that there's something else that's out there. What probably keeps us up at night is an awareness that we don't have the courage to do it, or a belief that we want to, but I can't because of my environment, or because of this, or because of that. Yeah, those things can constrain you, man, but you can get out of the well. What's really limiting us, maybe in that perspective, is the courage to do it, because humans did it with way less than we have. Man, they traveled the Saharan Desert to get out of, to get out of Africa and, and then populate the world, and you see where we are today. So other humans did far more with way less than us, but it takes courage to do that. Now, can you imagine if you do get out of that well, and you're that well frog, and you go back, and you jump back down, and boom, boom, and, every, and then your family and your friends and everybody who's down there like, whoa, where'd you, where'd you come from? He, he came from the sky. And then imagine what you would tell them you saw. How could you describe it? How would you describe a tree to a well frog? 
How would you describe a bird? An airplane? A human? <laughs> An ant? You couldn't. What you'd have to do is go down there and say things like, So there's a, there's a human out there, and it's kind of like a marker, or whatever it is you have down there. And people will be like, I don't know, man, why are you talking in metaphors? Maybe that's why we use metaphors, guys, because we're trying to describe things that are indescribable outside of experience. We're trying to use metaphors so that we can explain to people what we've experienced, but we're trying to explain to people who have never experienced it before. It's impossible in some cases, man. And so, by the way, some of you guys are going to experience this. You're going to leave the, the city at some point, and you're going to go in, out into the world, and you're going to see things, and you're going to come back, and you're going to try to tell people about them, but you're going to understand that, man, you, you can't explain things to people who haven't experienced them. And it's going to pull at your heart. It can even be heartbreaking, because you want them to, to, to know what you know and to see what you have seen. Not because you want them to think what you think and do what you do, but because you know that you've been enriched by this, and you've been broadened by this, and you've become, you have more opportunity now to be who you are. Now, that to be a well frog is a choice. You get to decide if that's what you want to do. Not because you have to. And things are much better for us when we don't have to do anything. You know? And so, imagine now you jump back into that well, you try to explain things, nobody understands you. I don't know what your life is like after that. Do you feel like you don't belong? Do you feel like nobody, you can't connect with anybody? Some of you already feel that way. I imagine. Many of you, I imagine, already feel that way. That's okay. Because you probably don't belong where you are. But I'll let Socrates explain that to you. Questions? Comments? Concerns? Complaints? Criticisms? Critiques? 